So, it is November 2024, and a whole lot of people are doing videos like this, and I guess I'm going to pop on the bandwagon here, not that I'm a big bandwagon person, um, but this is post-election commentary. And so I'll be discussing the results of both the national and local elections. Um, discuss is maybe a little weird of a term for one person talking, but I guess it is tradition. So the first thing to, uh, to talk about is the presidential elections. The turnout was low, the election was fairly narrow, and it is important therefore to be careful with how strong of conclusions we uh, we draw from it like these people really should do this these people really need to do that I do have some thoughts on that but we should remember that this was a low turnout low election or uh, low um, low uh, overspill what's what's the right uh, th th this was not a sweeping a, 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 um, amazing election. It, it was just a fairly narrow one. A uh, lot of people who showed up in the last election didn't show up this time. Um, and so let's let's just keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the things. Um, Kamala Harris is the candidate that I supported. Uh, I also uh, funded her um, her campaign considerably. Uh, she didn't win. She went with, an, uh, with a certain campaign strategy that was intentionally very bland, uh, or at least I think it was, to make it easy for voters of all kinds to vote for her, but it inspired very few. I think this probably relates to the low, uh, low turnout. But the hope was that just seeing how crazy and stupid and awful Trump is, uh, it would be easy for crossover voters to turn up, and she didn't really have to do very much. But it turns out that a lot of voters didn't see Trump's attempt to cheat the last election and his other dangerously bad civics. They didn't see these things to be disqualifying. They should have, but they didn't. Um, and it's important to remember that when you're, when you're gambling on that, that you might lose. A whole lot of people don't actually think a lot about civics. They're not necessarily worried about what happens if we put people in office who don't really believe in electoral politics. And uh, you, you can try and make the case for them, but, they, but it's not an automatic win. And I think uh, a certain amount of hope was there is that people would realize, you know, the guy tried to cheat uh, in the last election after he lost, we'll never vote for him. And again, that, that would have been nice. It really would be nice if people automatically did that, but you can't count on it. Uh, another hope that didn't turn out to be true is that people would just be bothered by his really stupid ideas, some of which he tried to do in his last um, election, like let's annex uh, Greenland. Um, and the bad ideas of his uh, friends, like let's end vaccines and consider getting rid of fluoridation from water uh, again, the, these things probably should be disqualifying. People should have probably seen these things and thought, oh, Jesus, this guy is nuts. We'll never vote for him. But they didn't, or they did that, but they then decided not to vote at all. And that is a, uh, so that was a bad bet, assuming that that was a bet that they made. And we don't really know what's going on inside campaign planning headquarters, so we are speculating and it's possible that we're being quite unfair or making mistakes. Um, but uh, if, if you're too afraid to speculate, then you're basically not saying anything. Um, moving on to a, thing, a few things that might be more contentious. Democrats have long been saddled by a division uh, in the left and Naturally, both the left and the right are broad coalitions. They're not monoliths. Uh, you get a whole bunch of people with different beliefs showing up at the ballot box. They might not all agree with each other. Might not, they might not all like each other. And if you really want to get fine grained, you could probably find five or ten different factions on the left and five and ten, uh, or ten different factions on the right that, um, that form kind of the, the cloud 
that's the Democratic Party, and the cloud that's uh, the Republican Party. Um, and I know that the, these factions are not monoliths. I fairly frequently get in uh, long, sometimes heated arguments with other people on the left. Um, I try not to do it in the workplace because workplaces have become kind of ugly uh, that way. But broadly speaking, um, I think the, the left has had a problem with the uh, neo-progressives. This is a particular, fairly small, but extraordinarily loud faction on the left. They're a moralizing faction. They like to declare things racist, sexist, all sorts of ists. Now, I'm not saying that the, these terms never should be used, but they're dramatically overused um, by neo-progressives. And the, the more hardline among them finds uh, everything fascist. And I'm not saying nothing's fascist. Uh, and in fact, I, I have... Uh, I've talked in the past about how I think there's a good case for calling Trump fascist. There's a really good case for uh, for an Israel calling Smotrich and Ben Gvir uh, fascist, even though I don't think the term really fits BB. But that to me, I have a very particular set of definitions that I can lay out and I can show you how the people that I call that uh, actually fit the definitions. And you can disagree with the definitions and I'm not going to be upset with people who disagree with how I lay out the terms, but I'm not using it as a general, these are people I dislike, they're fascist, or may, I, I also reject the idea that the mainstream is fascist. It's not, uh, I use the term in a more controlled, thoughtful, deliberate way, but neo-progressives don't. They apply the term very broadly. They've often called me fascist, they, they uh, or racist, or, um, uh, anti, uh, anti LGBTQIA plus plus whatever the hell that acronym is right now, even though I'm not straight. Uh, I've been in Bigala movements for a fairly long time until they were kind of swept aside by all that nonsense. But in any case, the, the problem here is that the Democratic Party, because it sees progressives as a valuable part of its base, it doesn't uh, doesn't critique their overreach, and it accidentally has allowed itself to become identified with the neo progressives. And I, I I should note as well that I use the term neo progressive because the post two thousand five uh, coalition that calls itself the progressives has little historical ties to the old progressive movements in the um, early to mid nineteen hundreds. Um, that's the term I use. You can prefer different terms, but that's what I mean when I say neo-progressive. And very occasionally I'll just say progressive, but I'm trying just for, for clarity's sake and to deny the legitimacy of that claim that they're the same people as the old progressive movement. I try to use the term neo-progressive. Anyhow, Dems have been smeared and it's not entirely a smear because there's some truth to it with the idea that the progressive parties uh, or uh, progressive ideas dominate the party and the social movements attached to it. And ideally, uh, Dems, uh, in my, well, uh, ideally in my view, Dems should be curbing progressivism and being very careful to say, these are not our ideas. This is not our so social movement. Progressives are really their own thing, or at least they're somewhat distinct. Trump's campaign actually had a solid, if very brief, ad poking fun at pronoun culture. Uh, and I think the ad went something like, she's here for they, them, we're here for you. It was a brilliant ad. Um, and uh, not that, uh, not that I, I necessarily entirely, I'm not sure what to think about the sentiment. I really don't like pronoun culture. I don't take part in it. I refuse to acknowledge it. I, I, I just use the pronouns um, he or she, and I use it for genetic gender, and that's it. Um, but uh, you get all these non-binary people who get really, really angry, and they jump down your throat if you don't go with their they, them thing, which I just, I don't do. It sometimes leads to conflicts, and I'm always worried that at work, the issue might come up, and it might be a uh, career, uh, well, job ender, but 
And likewise, Latinx polls extremely poorly, except among neo-progressives, where they really seem insistent that people use it. Um, same thing with this robust defense of DEI, which is a neo-progressive thing. My faction, uh, which is kind of, I mean, really, I kind of stand at the intersection of a few factions on the left. I'm a liberal. I'm a technocrat. And uh, in a very, very nuanced way, uh, I'm a socialist, but uh, I'm a gradualist socialist, um, definitely not, not revolutionary. Uh, and I'm, I also don't see the socialism part as being that important. If it never ends up actually working out, then I'm okay with dropping it. Most importantly, I'm a technocrat. Um, with, uh, with liberal social values, not progressive social values. I value tolerance. I don't value validation. We used to be the main driving force in the Democratic Party. And by the numbers, we actually probably still are, but we're not very loud. A lot of our views are kind of moderate and boring uh, because we believe in policy. We don't believe in heroes and we don't tend to believe in slogans. Um, and we generally also just think that the policies are, are the most important thing. Um, having uh, supportive social programs is important to us, but we just don't generally care about a lot of the social concerns that have been raised by neo-progressives uh, since the birth of their movement sometime around 2005, or at least the radical growth of their movement around there. Uh, radical, ha ha ha. Uh, anyhow, yeah, so the, the Dems also didn't uh, address, as in they, they didn't talk about it all, uh, they didn't really even put forth policy proposals, on certain areas of policy where progressives talk loudly and push deeply. The progressive policies are deeply unpopular. Um, progressives, the, the neo-progressives tend to be open borders types, or at least um, saying, if you can manage to get in, then we're never going to deport you. We don't really see any problem with you being here. Um, uh, it was basically, uh, let, let's maybe frown a little bit uh, at most, but probably not even that. And if you manage to sneak in, you're here, you're good, you're part of the family. It's, this policy is deeply un, uh, unpopular. It's not a policy, uh, policy I believe in. I find it to be a really bad idea. But the Dems didn't uh, actually uh, push back on it. They just remained quiet on the whole issue, more or less. Now, policy-wise, uh, Biden actually started tightening up the border, but he didn't talk about it because he wasn't really keen on pissing off the neo-progressives. He should have talked about it. He should have thrown them under the bus. Um, there's, there's a number of other neo-progressive ideas that really should be pushed back on. This whole defund the police thing, which again, it means different things to different people, but I reject it uh, in all its forms. At most, I think there are some sensible um, police reforms to be done. Um, I, I think that like de uh, demilitarizing the police is a good idea, not having them always carry guns uh, um, having more accountability, that stuff's good. But deciding that we actually ha should have dramatically reduced police presence, that we should um, that we should get rid of qualified immunity, things like that, those will hamper policing. And we need policing. All societies need policing. Now, there, there again, there's there's room for doing policing better, mandatory body cams, stuff like that. But that's not what the defund people are talking about, and the defund movement needs to be thoroughly disassociated with and condemned by the Democratic Party, uh, because otherwise it'll look like they approve of it, and that scares people, and it should scare people. People should not want to see their police department disappear. Uh, they shouldn't want to see these uh, shoplifting um, organized shop, uh, shoplifting things result in slaps on wrist and continued uh, stuff. Uh, they're, they're, and more broadly, just to dip briefly into philosophy, there are kind of three responses that you can take to social problems, uh, in, including crime. You can do neglect, which is typically what libertarians want to do. Let's just uh, pretend it's not there, pretend it's not a problem. 
um, because if the problem doesn't originate with the state, they're not really interested in dealing with it. Uh, that is a little bit of a, uh, of a overgeneralization, but broadly, uh, neglect is one of the three strategies. Uh, there's the nurture mentality, which is what um, neoprogressives uh, see as their almost their only method. But as liberals, we see this as uh, as useful too, uh, just not as as the only method. Where you hope to give people alternatives, you hope to build a wonderful environment that encourages people to be their best and they won't they won't do whatever the problem is you'll reduce crime and, and there are times when this works like if you build um community parks and stuff crime rates often go down you give people other things to do you give them healthy social opportunities uh and their parents show up they interact more with parents and so on it's it's good stuff it's not a bad policy it just can't be your only policy and then there's the discipline response. This is the, the third response that you can do to social problems where you just try and discipline the heck out of them. And this is, it's sometimes important to discipline. It actually often is. It can't be, or it shouldn't be your only response to social problems, but it should be in your toolbox. And uh, very often it should be what you actually do. Uh, police are part of the discipline side of things, not that police should only discipline but discipline needs to be on the table when you when you see people shoplifting and they do it again week after week you have you have to pull out discipline in your toolbox and do something about it and uh, pr uh progressive da's uh, are kind of no notorious for never wanting to use discipline and this is why they often get voted out or pushed out one way or the other because people see Oh shoot! We, uh, we put one of those guys in office, and they're screwing everything up. And we're seeing repeat crime. Uh, we're seeing first graffiti, then petty crime, theft of service, uh, shoplifting, and eventually you find yourself in a place you really don't want to be. So that, there's just there's a lot of progressive ideas that need to be condemned and put to bed if. Democrats want to have, want to do better in the ballot box. Now, there's also things like Israel, which uh, un under BB, uh, we're, we're seeing kind of a madman approach. Let's just fuck everything up. Uh, let's really, really hurt the Arabs as much as we can. Uh, let's embrace ethno-nationalism. Let's have fascists in the cabinet. Uh, ethnic cleansing is cool now, apparently. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the far uh, the far right and the populists just seem to be Israel gets a blank check. They can do whatever they want. Uh, it doesn't matter if their laws are terrible. Any any response to them is illegitimate. And I don't believe that. I, I think that uh, the violence coming from the Arabs sucks, but so does the uh, the legal uh, system, the ethno nationalism that Israel has set up and some violent uh, response to that should happen. Uh, both of them eventually will need to fix their politics, but they need to do it at the same time. You can't expect one side to unilaterally disarm in the same way that, that in the US, if we still have slavery, there would and should be violent opposition to that until it stops. Uh, and that is essentially what is happening in Israel. You have absolutely terrible laws, racist laws, uh, you have people advocating ethnic cleansing, reaching high positions of power, and uh, the status quo is not livable. And so people will and should respond to it militarily. Um, now, ideally, they should be as targeted as they can. They should be really make sure that they make it clear that this is why we're doing this. But the problem is the, our, the right in, in the U.S. doesn't seem to really get this. They seem uh, pretty cool with giving Israel a blank check and seeing any uh, attacks on this uh, Israeli status quo as being an atrocity. And yes, these things are atrocities, but they're responding to standing atrocities when you have laws that are that give explicit racial advantage. Uh, it justifies some violence, and this is something which. Uh, unfortunately, because the left is divided on the topic. Uh, the, the response is to spend, to be quiet, 
to, to not talk about it. There's uh, been kind of a vague hope that maybe Harris will be tougher on Israel, will push Bibi to end uh, his current madness, but um, but uh, there, there certainly wasn't talk about it on the campaign. And people want to hear what's going on. Um, there's on another topic there's strongman politics to deal with trump was a terrible president uh he delivered on very few of his promises many of those promises were pretty horrible anyhow so many of them were not within his power to do because presidents are not dictators but he always said he was doing a great job he always said that he got done what he said he was doing and all his failings he just claimed they were illusory or somebody else's fault and it never was his fault for over promising or promising a bad idea. Trump really embodies this big lie theory that you can just lie repeatedly and people will believe you. You never back down and people can just sign on to that and go along with whatever you say. When you have a base audience uh, that uh, only listens to one news source, uh, and uh, then it becomes really hard to pull people out of that, men uh, that mentality important to try to do so rather than to sink to that level and we do see some people suggesting the Democrats should sink to that level lie openly have strongman politics and so on but this is not something that Democrats generally have done it's not something they should do this in my view is one of the few high road things that they should commit to I should I should note that I say they because while I generally uh, my values are more aligned with the Democratic Party than the Republican Party, and I often vote for Democrats. I am not a registered uh, Democrat. I'm an independent. Um, that might not really mean much uh, to some of you, uh, but uh, I see it as important. I've talked about it in another video, so I won't go into it, uh, into why here. There's another, uh, but there is that strongman politics. It, uh, a lot of countries get stuck in it. You get people like Berlusconi where they just have a big personality and people like strong leaders. They like people who always give them reassurance. They, they like people who point them at enemies and they don't evaluate them on whether their policies have produced good results or even their ability to produce, uh, to execute those policies. Uh, strongman politics are really bad for a country, but they're always attractive uh, to a sufficiently bored uh, population with bad enough civics. And on that note, there's just a perpetual dissatisfaction and sometimes boredom in a rich country uh, like the U.S., because we are a very rich country with a very strong economy, that, that just leads to an eagerness for change. It doesn't matter what the change is. Uh, there's this perpetual attraction of just saying, I'm going to change things up. And a lot of people don't get that their dissatisfaction really doesn't have much to do with politics. Sometimes it does. I mean, there are important political things. Um, there are areas where bad politics can lead to a worse life, but there's also a lot of people who have, weren't living that well for reasons unrelated to politics but they nonetheless decide I, I need change and they hear somebody talking about change and they feel drawn. Uh, and a lot of people also just don't get that certain kinds of improvements are nearly impossible or take, take a lot of hard work and fine tuning of policy. And so that leads people to be tempted to approve of leadership that just looks at all the levers, the, all the policy levers that are out there uh, and say, I'm going to flip all of them, or I'm going to flip a lot of these levers. I'm, I'm just going to change things up and maybe things will be better. And they don't realize how far they have to fall. And they don't realize that they're never going to live like royalty. Now, there are certainly areas where politics can make a big difference in life. Healthcare can be one of them. Immigration policy can be another. Positive or negative, there are some policies that really matter. But just uh, offering vague notions of change, and it's not like the right is the only side that does this. Sometimes even very good uh, candidates, very good leaders like Obama. Uh, in my view, Obama was really a quite good policy guy. He was a very good president. Um, he made some mistakes, but by and large, I, I have all the respect for him. 
but he a big part of his campaign was run on this vague notion of change uh, and it never was like it never was quantified what is the change that you're running on no people just wanted change and they didn't really know what they wanted but they wanted something different and there's always going to be that attraction uh, when you have uh, voters who are just in a certain head state it'd be good to pull them out of that head state but that's where they are you have to meet them where they are uh, there's a few other notes Democrats can't treat minorities as safe votes anymore Biden should probably have stepped aside sooner um, the primaries didn't really mean very much when he stepped aside uh, when the primaries were mostly done um, it would have been nice uh, if people had more time to to learn who Harris is uh, certainly if her campaign had had to provide some content had engaged with people across the political spectrum more but it was a fairly close election uh, so all this needs to be taken in that context so just in short, in my view, Dems should toss neo-progressives off the boat. They should figure out what they stand for and talk about it and not be afraid to talk about it. Uh, even if it might alienate some voters, people I hopefully will respect that you stand for something. Also, we need in the country to build a culture where we reject strong men and where we evaluate people and policies by their results well, accepting a certain amount of randomness, enters into the process, as well as external actors and not blaming uh, uh, policies or p uh, politicians for things that can't be predicted. And we really, really need to push the importance of people accepting democracy, using available expertise, and of following mostly stable policies that uh, when, when relevant, follow mainstream science in reputable fields. Uh, if the Dems do those things, in my view, they'll do better. Won't mean they'll win every election. Sometimes their, their candidates will suck, or sometimes uh, people will get bored, there, there will be failures, but these are things that I think would help d Democrats do better. But toss those progressives off the boat, disclaim them, cr criticize them, make it clear they're, uh, they're not uh, us. Democrats really need to do that. Next, we're done talking about uh, POTUS. I'm going to talk briefly about the NYC ballot proposals. Firstly, uh, uh, this was this a New York State thing? Actually, I don't know if this was a state or city thing. There, there's an Equal Rights Amendment, which added a, a whole number of protected categories to the existing list for employment and a whole bunch of other things. I voted no on this, primarily because it adds protection for gender identity, and I reject gender identity. It, in my view, unfortunately won at 62%. I'm annoyed because I think this will be hard to remove later. It would have been better to have blocked it from entering because rolling these things back is politically difficult. People come to depend on certain rights, it becomes part of the social contract, and so rollbacks are hard. Second ballot proposal. This extended uh, what the Department of Sanitation um, uh, is responsible for. It clarifies their charter. I voted yes, but I didn't feel super strongly about it. It won with 62%. Nice boring ballot proposal. Uh, the, the third thing is the, um, uh, the mayor's OMB, which is a budgetary um, informational service. They were um, charged to do financial analysis of bills before uh, the city council. I voted yes, and it won with 56%. It's boring, except I'm amused how angry the progressive city council of New York was about this and how hard they tried to stop it. Uh, they actually tried to stop uh, most of these. Um, and I generally think that they're they're not doing a good job. I don't like their politics. Again, they're, they're near progressives. Their, their politics are bad in my view. Uh, I'm kind of happy at how uh, pissed off they were about it. And I'm very pleased that, that they lost. Even if the result here I mean, this, this, this particular one I see is positive. I think it's good to know what the budget predictions are for uh, bills. 
but um, it's not necessarily something that couldn't have been done in some other way. Uh, the next is there will be more notice on certain bills, um, on certain types of bills before uh, the city council. I voted yes, but I didn't feel super strongly. This was a win with 57%. Um, again, happy that the city council lost this one. Uh, I don't particularly like how Mayor Adams seems to be uh, pretty corrupt, but I do like his politics and many of these ballot proposals were things that uh, he introduced. Um, I don't know if he did it through a proxy or if he did it directly, but uh, they are his handiwork. Um, <clears throat> The next is a capital planning requirement that requires um, city offices to do projections uh, on their budget and how it impacts capital planning. I didn't vote on this one because I didn't really have a full enough understanding of what it would do. <clears throat> it won with 58%. City Council lost. Happy that they lost, but I, I, I don't really have any opinion on this particular matter felt very, very technical, and I felt that I would have needed to have really studied uh, local procedure a lot to really develop an opinion on it. And I, I didn't, so I just didn't vote uh, on this one. Uh, there's the final ballot proposal, which would have, which was kind of a grab bag of proposals, but the main thing leading it was the creation of a chief diversity officer for the city. And I was very happy to vote no on this. Um, I, I think that the diversity movement is a bad idea. Not that diversity is bad, but I also don't think it's good. Uh, ideally, you don't want to have people pushing against it, but then you let whatever happens, happens. Uh, the idea is that we don't positively value diversity. Uh, we, we just make sure that we're not um, opposed to it if it happens to show up. We just see it as mostly irrelevant. Um, that, that is the, the a fairly common liberal view on things. Uh, uh, Neo-progressives really like to have all this DEI stuff and positive um, discrimination uh, to create diversity. And I, I oppose that. And I oppose chief diversity officers. I think that it would be a waste of, um, waste of money. And I think it would divert policy outcomes uh, away from where they probably should be going. So I voted no. And I'm happy to see that it lost. It only got 47% approval. Although 3% is not something to celebrate, I would love to see it lose at 30%, 20%, 10%, or just not be introduced, because this means it'll probably, somebody will try it again. Uh, so I would have loved to have seen a wider margin, but I'm happy to see a DEI position fail to happen. Um, now, as for the uh, the other positions that were on my ballot, uh, for the state courts, I didn't vote because the primary settled it. I think they had like five positions and five candidates. It's, it's like uh, that doesn't feel like a healthy democracy to me. Uh, there, there's little point in actually voting for people uh, in that case. And I'm hoping that there was very, very low turnout on that. I, why could some other political party not find somebody else uh, to run uh, run for those positions? I mean, surely that can't be that difficult. Somebody should have at least tried. <clears throat> I mean, maybe they need more petitions than they could get. Maybe they actually started the petitioning process, just didn't rise to the level needed. But something should change on this. Somebody should fix it so that there's at least some amount of choice. For federal senator, um, I didn't feel very strongly on this one because uh, you, you'll see this again later. Um, the Republicans actually ran somebody decent. And Gillibrand, uh, it was Gillibrand versus Sa uh, Sapri Kone. Don't really know how to pronounce that. Sapri Kone actually seemed to be pretty decent. This wasn't a Trumpy person or a nut job person, uh, or at least not that I could find with spot research. Um, I generally want to support moderate Republicans until we have more competitive elections. Um, 
it's not that I generally am keen on the Republican Party, but I'm also not devoted to the Democratic Party, but I want to see healthy elections. So I actually voted for Sapri Kone. Um, I didn't think he would win. He didn't win. Gillibrand won. Uh, there were parts of both of their um, platforms that I uh, liked and parts that I didn't like. But uh, again, I, I want to see more reasonable Republicans and I, I want to see the Republic uh, Republican Party to back off from its current, let's embrace all the nut jobs we can find. For the Congress representative, um, 12th district, uh, I didn't like Nadler and I deeply respected the Republican Zumbluskas for condemning Trump for his attempt to overturn the last election. Um, so I actually voted for Zumbluskas uh, um, because I didn't really like either of them, but I so respected a, a Republican who was willing to stick his neck out and condemn Trump. Uh, kudos to him. Uh, if Nadler hadn't had a whole bunch of policy things I didn't dislike, then I may have voted for him, I may have, uh, but I, I didn't. <clears throat> but yeah, there are cases where I will vote Republican if I think they're being brave, if I see a role that hasn't had a Republican for a very long time, and uh, if they're not populist, and if, if their policies are not super awful. Um, and once, once things even out a little bit, if they ever do, then I will probably more reliably vote Democrat in, in that case, but I didn't this time. For state senator, 47th district, I didn't vote because I disliked both. Um, Hoyleman Seagal is a um, is local state senator. I've met the guy um, uh, and I just, he is uh, one of these neo-progressives. He's pretty far out there. I just do not like his politics, and I've fairly frequently written to him uh, uh, on particular areas, but he just keeps on pushing policies that I really, really hate. But the person running against him, I didn't, uh, also didn't like. Uh, so, but I just didn't vote on this. Um, we needed to, in my view, find a liberal rather than a, uh, a neo-progressive to run for this office. We need to stop New York City's politics from being dominated by neo-progressives. Uh, this is something which we really need to fix, in my view. For the State Assembly, 75th District, the primary settled it. Uh, there was no point in voting, so I won't cover the result because there really wasn't effectively an election there. Uh, so those are my thoughts on, uh, on a lot of these, uh, and those are the results. Um, I'm hoping that we find a way to fix a lot of the politics here. Again, fix is a very value-laden term. But there are changes that I would like to see. Uh, there are, um, I, I do not want to see Trumpy politics. I don't want to see neo-progressive politics. We need to find a way to, um, to get more of the right technocrats if they still exist and we can find them and if they're still electable at all. And the left uh, technocrats, particularly the liberals, uh, we need to get them back in power, we need to get them dominating the messaging, and we need to get all the stupid back out of our politics. Because Trump's politics are stupid, and they're dangerous. Uh, Neo-progressive politics may not actually be dangerous to our democracy, but they're bad policies, and they certainly endanger the Democratic Party. They make it hard for it to win elections that it should win handily. Uh, they need to be kicked out of, uh, out of the bus. Anyhow, um, that's the video. I know that no doubt a lot of things I've said are spicy to certain people. If you have comments, uh, leave them. I might or might not respond. Uh, but that, that, that's what I have to say about the recent elections uh, here. Bye-bye.